Hi, I'm Audra Dears Lawson, an associate professor at Christiana University College in crisis communication, and I want to take some time to talk about what we can learn about the importance of good pandemic communication by comparing the English and Scottish government's communication with their publics across the three waves of the COVID-19 pandemic. Though it's not always apparent outside the United Kingdom, the UK is comprised of four separate nations, England, Northern Ireland, Scotland, and Wales, and a number of policy areas like health are devolved to each of the member nations. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, though both the English and the Scottish COVID-19 death rates were higher compared to Europe, England's were significantly worse than Scotland's, despite sharing the island and a similar enough set of COVID-19 policies. One of the notable difference was how the two governments communicated with the public during the pandemic. While English and Scottish politicians and health experts communicated on a daily basis, both campaigns relied on the visual messages available in the media, during press briefings and online, making the campaigns visual arguments for self-protective behaviors. The bottom line is that we know how this story ends, but we don't know how we got there. One of the challenges in comparing different national health campaigns can be dissimilarity in culture, language, social and political systems. Additionally, within the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, there are challenges in comparing radically different material responses to the pandemic, like the health policy implemented. However, given England and Scotland share a three century national history, language and overarching political structure in the British government and had similar devolved policy approaches to the pandemic, they provide the opportunity to directly and meaningfully compare divergent communication strategies. Therefore, we use this comparison between the English and Scottish government response to COVID on social media to directly evaluate the impact and the importance of political and health communication during pandemics, focusing on the combined use of visual and textual information to communicate. So what I'll do in this presentation is give a brief background on visual communication, then focus on the English and Scottish comparison. A question is, how can we judge whether the messages were effective? When effective, visual messaging should enable audiences to better understand and feel more involved with the messages, accessible and understandable health information is especially critical during crises and particularly during pandemics. The public needs to know what risks they face and how they can protect themselves against these risks. Lack of credible information can create gaps for misinformation to thrive or for correct information to be interpreted incorrectly. This suggests that effective visual messaging is and should be a part of providing good public health response during a pandemic. This communication is essential for saving lives by reducing risk reinforcing desirable health attitudes and behavior. Unfortunately, public health communication gaps have led to fatalities during pandemics and closing them is crucial for stopping the spread of conspiracy theories, misinformation and disinformation, which decreases trust in governments and international and national health agencies, thus adversely contributing to increased infections and potentially deaths. The framework's core assumption is that the combination of effective visual images and text will improve audience recall, retention, and comprehension of core messages in a campaign. Improving the impact of visual messages means we need to manage visual complexity. It can be managed through the reduction of visual clutter that results in mental noise. Visual clutter negatively impacts information retention and comprehension. In part, this can be achieved through effective visual design, such as clear color schemes, scale, visual hierarchy, and balance. Each of these helps to ensure that the most important messages are seen first and control the delivery of the experience. Research also suggests that an effectively branded visual campaign will generally reduce the visual complexity and ensure maximum engagement and positive affect to the messaging. 
Similarly, in the discussion of good visual branding, the literature suggests that beyond the aesthetic qualities of good visual branding, a good brand creates identification with the object of the campaign. A symbolic brand can strengthen viewers' self-brand connection, which can also amplify the effectiveness of the message. Effective visual clues enhance comprehension and information recall in with complex arguments, and they have the potential to create a cultural memory of events, messages, or instructions. This helps to explain why the effective use of iconic or symbolic visual messages can help pandemic communicators move beyond challenging scientific and data-driven arguments by telling a story that emotionally resonates with the viewer. Additionally, in using visual icons and symbols, the campaign can more effectively overcome objections because the symbolic or iconic imagery is associated with truth-telling and especially important in the context of crises or disasters. Narratives are critical to successful communication strategies because they help to improve public understanding of technical information, communicate in ways appropriate to belief systems and values, and persuasively guide individual and collective choices. There is some research on the role of narratives in pandemic communication. While there are many roles that the narratives can serve, it is important that they're credible, they fill in information gaps, and create opportunities for engagement and follow-up information. But most importantly, the text accompanying the visual needs to provide clear and useful instructions or behavioral recommendations. This can be essential for changing attitudes, intentions, and behaviors, especially those delivered via audio and video with detection and prevention messages. These are more effective compared to just print-based narratives. So this is a study using social media, but not exactly a study about social media. Our rationale in using social media for collecting the visuals was simple. We wanted messages that had been widely disseminated from the governments, not just messages sitting on a government's website. We also wanted a platform that used both the visual and verbal to see how governments set up the visual message. We chose these two Twitter handles because they were the most comparable and were coming from the government sources and not public health. For this presentation, we're only going to talk about the specific health-related messages. The governments use social media to discuss many things from routine updates to policy related to COVID-19. But our analysis was based on a qualitative three-step constant comparison approach, including first, open coding to identify critical themes, second, axial coding to put those themes into context and identify exemplars of those themes, and third, selective coding to compare emergent themes against the VISTA model and previous research on visual communication. As we will talk about, the communication from both England and Scotland went well beyond the two main campaigns. However, the two main campaigns were for England, stay alert, control the virus, save lives, and for Scotland, the facts campaign. These were principal graphics used in each. And I think right off, it becomes easy to tell one of the critical differences in the information communicated by the two countries. While the England visual is certainly simpler, it lacks message clarity, iconography, and symbolism, and it just doesn't stand on its own. For example, what does stay alert actually mean? We just don't know from this visual. By comparison, if we see the Scottish one, we have a much clearer understanding of the directions we are supposed to follow and will be given throughout the campaign. This means that when we get a more detailed picture from the campaigns about what they mean, the Scottish one is basically the same. It uses a few more words, but the theme doesn't change and the core talking points never change. By comparison, the English campaign has to define what staying alert means, and all of a sudden it means basically the same thing as the facts campaign, but that doesn't help the viewer to remember any of these instructions. Whereas once we learn what the acronym facts mean, we know what we're meant to do. However, this is only the start of the story. While the core recommendations may have been very similar, 
there was little else that was similar in how the two governments communicated with their people throughout the pandemic. So let's compare the two in more detail. After analyzing the messages across all three waves of the COVID-19 pandemic in the UK, it was relatively easy to begin to characterize the communication approaches from England and Scotland. For most of the pandemic, England used what I would call a shotgun approach to their health messaging. What I mean by this is that in a relatively short period of time, a few days to a few weeks at most, the government would post a huge number of different messages centered on the particular theme. Individually, most of the visuals were clear and many were well-designed and well-executed visuals. However, the English communication approach lacked a strong visual branding for the campaign, while the stay alert part of the messaging had the logo that we can see in the middle and on the right. This was the most clearly branded part of their messaging, and in terms of the volume of messaging, only represented a small proportion of their instructive communication efforts from the start of the pandemic until early 2022. The most consistent visual branding was to include the NHS logo on most images, whether the message was focused on the NHS or not. Finally, most of the English campaign relied on flat or still images in their posts. Relatively few used short videos or even GIFs to communicate. So, like a shotgun, England produced a lot of projectiles with a wide spread to try and hit their targets. My assumption is that the objective was to try to communicate to a variety of audiences using the visuals to try and catch different people's attention. The problem with a shotgun approach is that while a single image may catch someone's attention, the campaign typically lacked clear instructive information beyond what text might be seen on the visual and almost never included links to follow up information. This meant that the English campaign didn't use the Twitter text to try and create a narrative, to fill in information gaps, to encourage engagement with the information, nor did it offer clear behavioral recommendations in many cases for the public to follow. This stands in direct contrast with the Scottish approach, which was well branded. From the beginning of the pandemic through February 2022, there were only about 12 templates for messages that were used, regardless of whether the visuals were flat images or short videos. Each of the visuals had a core campaign message, a familiar look and feel, and every visual had text accompanying the visual that provided a clear instruction, and nearly all of them had links for people to go for follow-up or additional information. Aesthetically, while many of the English images were probably more attractive than the Scottish ones, the Scottish images used familiar visual design, consistent color themes, and even common approaches to filming people to ensure campaign consistency across all parts of the health messaging throughout the pandemic. Visual messages from the Scottish government were often repeated several times, and the duration of key messaging on all aspects of the campaigns lasted for a comparatively longer period. While any single message from the Scottish government might have had less potential for visual impact compared to many of the English ones, the repeated use of the messages meant that the core messaging and instructional information would be more memorable. Repetition and consistency were the hallmarks of the approach used by the Scottish government to communicate with their public. Now, both campaigns evolved throughout the three waves of the pandemic in the UK, so let's take a look at the differences in visual messages from England and Scotland across the pandemic. Of course, I already mentioned the two primary campaigns from both governments. However, those were not the only emergent campaign themes in the communication from the English and Scottish governments. During the first wave, the central message from the English government centered on what people should do, with a particular focus on getting tested for COVID-19. Six supporting themes emerged in the visual messages from England. Scotland's approach also provided clear recommendations on what people should do, but also focused on the collective sense-making to provide a context for the recommendations and rules that were emerging. Scotland's focus during wave one did also focus on fewer themes.
Here are a couple of exemplars from England and Scotland respectively. On the top row we have the English examples and on the bottom row the Scottish ones. The top right message is an example of one of the best messages from the English campaign because it clearly was showing how to wear a face covering and provided a link for more information. However, the message in the top left from May 2020 is problematic because it was communicating, and let me emphasize this, in May of 2020, just thought I'd reiterate that, that COVID was nearly over, that people just had to carry on a bit longer. It's functionally setting up an expectation for what's coming. We contrast this to the bottom left for Scotland, which keeps the point simple and uncomplicated, while also offering an affirming argument that people are helping but without promises that the pandemic was nearly over. The bottom right emphasized the same core message as the top right, but did so by showing a short video that not only showed people how to wear the mask correctly, but also different versions of incorrectly wearing and explained why it was important to wear the face covering correctly. Despite these differences though, the communication between the two governments complemented each other during wave one. And then we come to wave two, where some of the themes remain consistent between England and Scotland, but the overall look and feel of communication from the English and Scottish governments began to look very different. England's messaging prioritized compliance with the rules, getting vaccinated, and celebrating Boris Johnson as the leader who is supporting people throughout the pandemic. It's important to put the themes in that perspective because the divergence that emerges is sharp. But within the frame of compliance, vaccination, and Boris, six themes also again emerge from the visuals, but the overall tone was more negative, combining blame, fear, and individual responsibility. Scotland's messaging can be summarized by the phrase, what to do and why. The messaging had a positive, supportive, and informative tone that prioritized self-protective behaviors, but more importantly, explained the rationale for the government's recommendations to its public. So the messaging broadened during wave two for the Scottish government, and most notably, the messaging focused on positive social support, with its themes highlighting the importance of self and other protective behaviors. When we compare the visuals used by England and Scotland, the argumentative differences between the two become fairly clear. Let's take to start the messages on the left that focus on the rules. Whereas Scotland was talking about the rules in the bottom left, the messaging focused on safety and the guidance. Now, even though the guidance was law, just as it was in England, the Scottish government did not focus on compliance, but encouraging people to make the choice to stay safe. Compare that to the top left at where the message was designed to ensure compliance by identifying the punishment. This was typical of the types of differences emerging across wave two. What remained positive and pro-social in the Scottish government's messaging changed in the English government's messaging to threats and fear. An even sharper contrast is the nearly post-apocalyptic fear-based message used for this stay-at-home message in England from mid-January 2021 compared to the stay-at-home message used by Scotland also in mid-January 2021 that focused on the national clinical director explaining why it was important to stay at home based on good information and without overselling the risk. Also emerging during wave two was that these messages exemplified a Scottish argument about the social solidarity needed to protect people's lives, including their own. And this is compared with the English argument that focused on blaming people for failing to follow the English government's guidance and rules. Wave three saw the sharpest change in England's communication about COVID-19. Not only did the number of themes have, but so did the number of messages. What became clear in wave three was that the English government wanted to stop talking about COVID and to talk about other topics. England's core health messaging focused on their central health strategy, ensuring that people were vaccinated and boosted against COVID. Certainly during wave three, as the proportion of deaths and infections decrease, it warranted a change in communication strategy. 
However, the messaging from England was utterly one-sided from the English government. In the US, Rudy Giuliani was mocked for using a noun, a verb in 9-11 in his failed presidential bid. And frankly, a noun, a verb, and vaccinate is what we can say about the English approach to communicating about COVID. Where there were other themes communicated, they were few and far between. So aside from describing rule changes, there was not a reasonable way to identify other themes other than to say that the government recommended some other self-protective behaviors. Scotland also narrowed their messaging focus to reflect the changing nature of infection and risk. However, they built on their facts campaign with a focus on being indoors during the winter and they maintained the test and protect argument, then focused more time on talking about the latest information about COVID, transmission, and risk. Scotland also emphasized vaccination, but the theme was book the vaccine and how to do it versus a simpler and more celebratory approach from England. To more clearly explain what I mean by this celebratory approach is to compare the top right message from England celebrating the number of doses given and in the text making an indirect recommendation to get vaccinated, but not offering a lot of clear directive or explanative information. Compare that with the bottom left message from the Scottish government that identifies a recommendation for a vaccine, provides evidence, and then provides a link to more information. Even England's focus on directive messaging in the top left was less informative and the link went to an explanation of the vaccine, not to the booking. So even though the behavioral recommendation was to get boosted, the link didn't help the viewer sign up for their booster vaccine. This is one of the few campaigns where England used a short video, but the video built an argument that vaccines were the pathway out of the pandemic, but nothing particularly deeper than that. By contrast, the testing video from the Scottish government in the bottom right provided more information in the text of the tweet, showed people how to do the tests correctly, and provided more information about testing in the link. In analyzing the data, the negativity of England's Wave 2 communication gave way to what seemed like apathy about COVID, but a celebration of the government in Wave 3. Scotland, however, maintained a similar emotional connection about the pandemic, but adapted the messaging to the changing situation. Where there was a celebratory message from the Scottish government, it was about people and not the government. So what can we say about all of this? We started with the conclusion of this story because we know that in a per capita comparison, Scotland has simply performed better, not only with a comparatively lower death rate, but also comparatively lower daily case rates and hospitalizations. There are a lot of possible factors contributing to this. However, when we look at the role of communication and visual communication, previous research very clearly indicates that effective communication saves lives and ineffective communication can cost them. After reviewing the communication in this project and living in England during the pandemic, it seems clear that the poor messaging, themes and approach in England contributed to its death toll. And by comparison, we see a different story emerge in Scotland. So there are four insights that we can take from this comparison. First, governments need to use visual branding to create familiarity, consistency, and trust in the messaging. Scotland's messaging may not have always been as visually dynamic as some of the messages from England, but the consistency and simplicity in the visuals made it easier to focus on the content. Part of the branding is also using and reusing messages. Scotland tweeted about 600 more health-related messages across the pandemic, but England had a meaningfully larger number of individual images. So branding isn't just about consistency of look and feel, but ensuring each message has optimal effectiveness, which in social media means that one shot at being seen just isn't enough. Second, both good visuals and good text are needed. One of the core weaknesses in England's self-protective messaging was the utter lack of contextualization or explanation of the visual message recommendations and lack of follow-up information with links. Moreover, the comparative use of flat images rather than short video clips meant that less information was being communicated by England in almost every single message. 
Third, the negativity in England's messaging was frankly astounding during the second wave. The focus on fear-based messaging when we were months into a pandemic, which had claimed 100,000 lives in the UK, would have suggested that people were already aware of the risk and were probably afraid. But it wasn't just the fear. It was the negativity from the compliance messaging that also seemed to create the conditions for psychological reactants. Even though not all the messages were negative, the positive ones were drowned out simply by volume. Scotland's messages remained positive, supportive, and like the government was having a conversation with its people and not admonishing them or trying to make them more afraid. And when we come back to the final insight, that is to remind us that there is significant documentation to suggest that negative messaging caused lies. The study doesn't provide direct evidence of that, but it offers a pretty good clue.